So I'm going to walk through a few slides here that um, describe E360. We'll do a little agenda and housekeeping, and then just talk about our view on the cold chain that sets up, I think, a lot of things we'll talk about today. So E360, you know, uh, lots of things are 360 today. And I think the point here is really pretty simple about this program. From a, from a um, industry standpoint, none of us is as strong as all of us. And if we all come together to look at issues from a 360, 360 degree point of view, you really walk away with a very powerful view of what's going on in the industry. And the E's are here are really pretty straightforward. Equipment, energy, environment, economics. And of course, there's other factors involved. But E360 is really our label for that point of th those kinds of events, where we all come together, just like all of us in this room today. Uh, I'm, I'm still really excited that so many raised their hands. I didn't know for how many of you this would be your first time. Because we all bring a fresh perspective. And really, in the course of the next eight or nine hours, we're all going to come up, up to speed on what we all know. And that's, um, that's what it's all about. So just a brief review of the agenda. I'll speak here up until 9 o'clock. And then I will introduce our first speakers, Rajan and Jennifer, who are going to give you a regulatory update. Then uh, James and Matt will come up and talk about power management in the supermarket space. And by the way, I should say, um, if I go back here, Today we have kind of a special focus on the food retail industry, supermarkets, the OEMs and suppliers that serve them, uh, distribution services and other partners. So really kind of a food retail uh, bent to today. It won't be exclusively food retail, but, but a lot of the content today will be focused on food retail. So as I said, uh, after Rajan and Jennifer, James and Matt will come up and talk about power management for supermarkets. And then uh, we'll have a panel discussion. Jason Bourne will be the moderator there, talking about trends in the refrigeration landscape. Then we'll break for lunch. In the afternoon, there's really three tracks. So you can, from 1 to 145, you can go hear about refrigeration and food retail, or store operations and facility optimization, or cold chain management. And then again, from 2 to 245, we'll have breakout rooms in the same three tracks. Then. At 3 o'clock, we'll all come back here. So this is where we'll end the day, back together. And Andre Patanel will talk about upgrading supermarket infrastructure and wrap us up. With that, I'm going to talk about complete and discrete answers for the cold chain. And I'll explain a little bit more about why complete and discrete. So this first slide is pretty simple and really kind of sets up how we think about the cold chain, that consumer commercial and regulatory demands require a tightly controlled cold chain. And uh, I don't know that that sounds all that controversial on the face of it. So the, the two things that I'd pull out here, though, are one, demands. There are a lot of demands that we all face. I'm sure you've got your own list at the top of your head. I'm going to talk a little bit about the demands that we see that are really changing the landscape of what we've got to provide. But where it all comes together, and where a lot of us work together, is the degree to which we have to tightly control assets, locations, enterprises, ships, trucks, tightly control has never been higher. The bar is just going up, it seems like, every day. So. Really what I want to talk about is what are those demands and then what does a tightly controlled cold chain look like? So, food safety. Certainly this is a changing uh, area of demand if you think about all of us as food consumers. There's several facts up here. One of them, one in six Americans contracts a foodborne illness each year. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we all eat three times a day, I, I think I eat more than that, maybe five or six. Um, but uh, you can't get away from the news about, about this. And I, just listening on the radio yesterday, there's another recall by a, 
a maker of bag salad from, uh, from Canada. And the point of the, the radio discussion was how frequent these recalls are becoming because the degree to which things like salmonella and listeria can be detected, the detectability has gone way up. So ignorance was bliss. We probably had these problems before, but the bar is being raised. And so that obviously causes several issues. Number one, the people eating those bagged salads obviously could be one of those one in six folks. But even beyond that, the cost of these recalls to these food producers is just incredible. And of course, they're taking it on the chin, both from a operating cost standpoint, recalls are very hard to do, but then their brand is tarnished. That's, that's a big problem. So food safety is certainly uh, part of where we see the bar raising. I would say also just food quality. Our expectations as food consumers is also raising the bar on the entire industry from the people that produce the food, transport the food, and sell it either at a supermarket or, or maybe on a restaurant plate. Fact up here that global sales of healthy food products estimated to now be over a trillion dollars. And you can see healthy food formats popping up everywhere. Now, from a food retail standpoint, that obviously changes everything. But one of the points that we're fond of pointing out is that freshness in food is really cumulative. What's happened on the supermarket shelf, for example, is certainly important to the freshness of that food. But where was it a day ago, a week ago, three weeks ago, and how was it treated? And the cumulative effect of all of those touches really affect food quality. So if you're interested in more on that, Amy Childress will be talking this afternoon and has, I think, a really interesting presentation that goes deep into the complexity of food and how it ends, what, all the, the ways it's touched before it ends up on the shelf. The next area that's changing is, is regulations, and we're going to talk about regulations today. It's, it's such a, um, a fascinating topic, and, um, and I think I'm really excited for you to hear from Rajan and Jennifer they're going to follow me here in a few minutes talking about regulations. It is such an amazing time. You know, in Emerson, we've got, also have a big air conditioning business in addition to our refrigeration business. And in the air conditioning business, the increasing efficiency regulations, that's been a dynamic for quite some time. But in refrigeration, this time right now is absolutely unprecedented in our lifetimes in terms of the amount of regulations that are coming at equipment manufacturers. Certainly from an energy efficiency standpoint, you see a fact up here that the DOE is mandating energy reductions that range from five to 50%. And when you think about the DOE, they're not actually stopping to say, you know, is 50% possible? Their assumption is that it's their job to lay down the challenge, it's our job to figure out how to meet the challenge. Well, that's, that's tough. But if we want to stay in this business, then that's what we've got to do. And then certainly the changing regulations from the EPA uh, are, are changing everything. So again, Rajan and Jennifer are going to talk about that. And I'm excited for you to hear their update. And then last, from a kind of changing demands on all of us, the infrastructure and, and maintenance impacts of just maintaining what we have as a country and as a marketplace is really pretty staggering. Somewhere north of 30,000 supermarket locations, if you just talk about traditional supermarkets, 30,000 supermarket locations, that's before you add the growing number of dollar stores and other outlets for food in the country. And uh, it falls on a lot of us to figure out how to maintain that infrastructure. Meanwhile, because of uh, the, um, the dynamics in the graying of America and the retirement of a lot of us that are, are approaching retirement age in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years, there's an estimated shortfall of 115,000 technicians, shortfall just to continue to support the industry at the current level, 115,000. 
I think that smells like opportunity, frankly, for people that are young people that are in school today. But it's, it's a challenge. And by the way, the new systems that are coming along aren't like the old ones. So these people are going to need to learn new things, new skills. And uh, we've got to find 115,000 more than we're generating right now. So a lot of, lot of significant um, uh, demands on all of us. And so when we use the word cold chain, here's the point. You think about food harvesting and, let's say, shipping and a supermarket retailer. All three of those entities, they get that they're part of a, of a chain, but they don't think about themselves as one industry. But what they do share are all the issues that we talked about below. And so more and more, it's really forcing a holistic look at all of those and how we together meet the challenges that I just talked about. I started the presentation by saying this was about complete but also discrete solutions. What does that mean? Well, from a discrete standpoint, just inside of transportation, there are specific issues and specific infrastructure that is not shared by all the rest of the cold chain that have to be tackled. One of the things that our transportation group continues to work on right now is how we use the controller and compressor at the end of refrigerated containers, that happens to be a big part of our business, how we use the data in those controllers to provide a health check, not for the contents of the container, but for the container itself when it arrives at its destination. There is massive cost in the transportation industry just in cleaning and checking containers. It's called a pre-trip inspection before the container can be turned and sent back out. Um, uh, a pre-trip inspection has to be conducted. Every one of those costs those shipping lines about $500 to $700. You multiply that by the millions of refrigerated containers out there, it's massive cost. So one of the things we're working on is a really a discrete application to help those container uh, shipping lot, the, the container owners, to say when a container comes in, is it a green light? Meaning the, everything operated correctly, all they need to do is cl clean it and turn it around, and that just costs them a, a, a fraction of that $500 to $700. Or maybe it's a, a red thumbs down, no, you need to look at this because it's actually approaching failure. Helping them to save millions of dollars so that's an example of a discrete approach just down inside of the transportation industry. On the left-hand side, though, obviously, uh, the dynamics I talked about earlier really set up for more of a complete look at the cold chain and how we take the data that exists in equipment and at locations and use it to start to solve some of the problems, address some of the challenges with food safety, food quality, regulations, and, um, and infrastructure costs. So as you look across those five nodes of the cold chain, and I apologize the words are so small here, we've really built up quite a big portfolio of technologies that we think make a lot of interesting pieces in how we tackle these challenges. So things, obviously, compressors and refrigeration systems, um, and then industrial refrigeration controls. Just uh, three years ago, we acquired some companies that make loggers and trackers that can track from node to node and stay with shipments. We acquired uh, Cooper Atkins, who's in temperature management. So any of you that are struggling with how to automate the collection of, of food safety data in a food prep area, right? Supermarkets aren't like the supermarkets many of us grew up with. You can take your family there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, obviously the health inspector cares about that, and there's a lot of burdens on those operations inside of supermarkets to keep that data that is so important from a health safety standpoint. Well, Cooper Atkins has a lot of technologies that they've brought to our team to really automate the collection of those uh, food safety logs. 
connectivity, insights, and services is part of what we do in project management. You can see checks throughout here. The point is that we think we've got a lot of interesting pieces, but on our own, we're not going to solve any of those challenges. It really takes all of us working together. There's sort of a trendy term that, you know, I almost feel like I can't get away from any day. If you listen to the radio or read the newspaper, I actually still read a paper-based newspaper. That's, that's how traditional I am. Yeah, not when I travel, but uh, the word digital transformation, digital transformation, and I'm not going to bore you with uh, my take on that, but I think it is a really important term because it, it honestly, not just our industry, it really affects every company, how we work, what we do for our customers. But for us, we really bring four different practical and flexible approaches to this. Obviously, we've got a lot of equipment, devices, components, compressors, controls, trackers and loggers. We've got a, a, a pretty complete portfolio of those sorts of uh, technologies that can be part of solving some of these challenges. But you can't attack complete solutions with a bunch of individual components. You got to think about architecture and systems and system design. I think uh, I'll bet in Jason Bourne's presentation we're going to get into that. Where's Jason? Jason, that's probably something you're going to talk about is architecture. Then there's enterprise visibility. So if you're uh, a retail chain with 1,000 locations, how do you have a visibility to all 1,000 locations and figure out where the challenges are? And then once you do that and you bring all the data back to one place, the, really, the real big win is condition management and optimization. How do you find the needles in the haystack that can really help you save money, deal with regula regulatory requirements and what have you? At Sprouts, this is just one example. At um, Actually in Atlanta where uh, several of us are from, that's where I'm from, in uh, Dunwoody, maybe I don't know where Derek is. Maybe three or four years ago, Derek? Where's Derek? Derek, what year did the, did the Dunwoody store open with CO2? Three years ago, yeah. So in Dunwoody, and then they've built a second store in, um, in Woodstock, Georgia, just north of there. But obviously, Atlanta is a very hot, humid climate, a uh, big challenge. And um, between Sprouts and Hill Phoenix and, um, and our teams, really brought a, a CO2 solution to work in that environment that um, has really been a very efficient approach, but obviously couldn't be achieved by just bringing a hodgepodge of components in there. Full electronic valves and controls, uh, compressors, the entire system really brought together as a complete solution at this site level. And Really, there's more now that can be done. If you look beyond things done at a site level, from an energy and sustainability standpoint, food safety and quality, infrastructure and maintenance, analytics and insights, if you think about that portfolio that I showed, we see lots of areas where we can attack these important areas. But, um, but I would just emphasize again that um, that's what that's what we have to bring to the table, but it's really about what all of you can do with that, uh, that that can help us to solve the challenges we talked about. Analytics and insights. You know, analytics and insights are great, but what really everyone's looking for is, how do I predict what's going to happen next? And that's really the important challenge. And I would say uh, for several teams at Emerson, we've been, we've been grinding on that and creating algorithms and other ways to look at data for really going on almost 20 years. And if we've learned anything, it's that we, because we've, in some cases, we've made the compressor and we've made the control and we understand the data, even that, we can't provide the value, the maximum value to the customer and really solve the problem if we do it alone. So working with other IoT and cloud providers Emerging innovators. We actually have, uh, we've got an innovation center in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia, that sits in the same building as an incubator space for startups. 
And we've actually found a lot of interesting crossovers where people can help us kind of join our coalition to solve some of these problems. Certainly industry partners and technology partners are part of this. But that's how you tackle these big challenges. You don't do it on your own. You do it by, by creating um, groups and coalitions. So, you know, for us, we really see a more efficient, sustainable, and con connected cold chain. Um, I, I think uh, while I, you know, hopefully you can see these charts from the back of the room, and they're very simple, and, and we all get it. We know that food moves from, from a farm all the way through into our fork. I'd really encourage you to, um, to reflect on this, but then as you go out through today's presentations, as simple as this looks, the complexity that will come out today is really pretty challenging. And again, I think the, the interesting thing is us all talking about how can we solve those problems together. Mm -hmm.